Welcome back to Black News Tonight. While many social justice advocates work within the established social structures to achieve gradual change, there are others who dare to advocate for a completely reimagined, radically reorganized system altogether. These activists are calling for abolition. And now there's a new book by a well-known abolitionist charting an easy to follow framework for everyday activists to fight for a new reality. Penned by the co-founder and former executive director of Black Lives Matter movement, Patrice Cullors, an abolitionist handbook offers relatable teachings on the history of abolition and how it can be used in our everyday lives as a source of collective care. Colors asks us to lead with love, fierce compassion, and precision. Joining me now is the New York Times best-selling author and artist, Patrice Colors, my sister. Good to see you, Patrice, as always. Oh, it's so good to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, before we talk about the book, I just want to get uh, something out of the way for our viewers. Uh, you are no longer with the Black Lives Matter movement uh, anymore, correct? That is right. I'm charting a new course. Mm -mm. Now, if what? Uh, let me let me let me actually jump for a second. You talk about organizing local and national governments to work towards uh, abolition. Uh, but for governments, both at local and national levels, the word uh, abolition, it's a scary, scary word. Well, what do you yes. offer so that they see abolition not as some kind of idealistic thing, pie in the sky, but as an actual viable option, an attainable vision uh, to deal with the current systemic problems that we have? I mean, that's a great question. And, you know, the best example I can give is my own hometown here in Los Angeles, where for about a decade um, to 15 years, local grassroots organizers from different organizations fought to end uh, two jails that were going to be built here. And, you know, many people told us we couldn't do it. Many people told us it wasn't possible. Um, many people told us that it was a uh, um, just a lofty idea, uh, but in the last three years, we stopped both of those jails. And in fact, Men's Central Jail, which is one of the largest jailers in the world, is on the train tracks to being shut down. And so policy that is centered around abolition is not just something that is a lofty idea, it's absolutely possible. And the last thing I'll say is, this same county that said, you know, 10 years ago, we couldn't shut down the jails is now has a whole report called Care First, Jails Last, where they're focusing solely on creating a mental health system for people across the country. And so abolition actually works. So there are going to be people who hear you say that and they're going to say, well, sure, uh, shutting down a prison works, uh, shutting down a couple prison works. And prison last sounds like a great idea. We all would love to lock people up last, but y'all abolitionists, y'all doing something else. Y'all not just saying don't build no more. And y'all ain't just saying make prison the last option. Y'all are telling us that we should imagine a world without prisons. How we get there and, and how do you justify that? I mean, I think we get there by doing the very work that we've been doing forever. Uh, but also I think we get there by asking some really hard questions, which is, have prisons and policing actually stopped social ills? Has it stopped things like murder? Has it stopped things like rape? Has it, those are the two things specifically that people ask the most about, most about, and it hasn't. And so I really wanna push and challenge the audience to really think and imagine about what is a world that we could live in where all of our needs are met, where we're all being able to uh, be treated with dignity, care, respect, um, and also challenge this idea that policing and imprisonment equals accountability. Because as abolitionists, we do believe in accountability. I would argue that we believe in true accountability because accountability actually transforms the very conditions where harm was caused. Hmm. So, when we deal with harm and we think about the people who are harmed, you know, someone steals my my watch, somebody uh, punches me in the face on the street, someone commits an act of sexual assault or sexual violence. 
without the, the, the legal system, the criminal legal system as our go-to system, without the prison as our catch-all, how do we figure out, how do we adjudicate disputes? How do we figure out how to help people get uh, some vision of justice? You know, in, in the book, I really try to describe the ways in which I've done it, um, the ways in which I've read others do it. And I really look, look to the work of Mia Mingus in particular. I look to the work of Cara Page in particular, two women of color who have really looked at transformative justice. You know, this is a concept of um, how we actually deal with real harm, how we deal with what happens in our communities and calling a stranger like a police officer or having a stranger that is a judge is not going to get us to the accountability that we want and we need. And so much of that looks like building our communities to have the capacity to deal with harm. And I argue, Mark, that our communities are already doing it. Um, I have a brother with severe mental illness and we made a choice as a family years ago that we would never call the police on him and that we would figure out ways to help him and steer him and get him the support and the care that he needs. And for anybody who has family member with severe mental illness, you know how difficult that can be and how challenging that can be. And so we, I think part of it is building our community capacity to show up for each other and to be each other's support systems. You know, in order to have that vision of abolition, you have to kind of rid yourself, we have to rid ourselves of the politics of disposability. You know, when there's a problem, you get rid of people. If, if someone, you, we criminalize our problems, we, we take mental illness and we end up criminalizing it. poverty, uh, addiction, we just make everything a crime, we throw people away so that we don't have to deal with it. Um, there's this way that not just at the social level and at the economic level, but also at the cultural level, we have a kind of disposability. Now, there's the yes. disposability piece that I just talked about, but then there's also this thing that people call cancel culture, where they're mm -hmm. saying that we're throwing people yes. away whenever they make a mistake, whenever they fall short. Is cancel culture a legitimate idea? How does it play into an abolitionist politics? It's a great question. And I'll actually... Um, say that I don't use the term cancel culture. I actually like to use the term carceral culture. Um, we live in a culture mm. that relies on punishment, on revenge. That's literally how we've been taught. That's what accountability looks like when we seek punishment, when we seek revenge. That's the way we're going to get our needs met. That's the way we're going to hold someone accountable. That's called carceral culture. We, we have been taught that. And that carceral culture comes from chattel slavery, right? So I think that's important. Um, cancel culture in some ways um, kind of uh, depoliticizes what, what's happening. It's actually carceral culture that's driving so much infighting, so much back backlash, um, so many ways that we harm each other and treat each other. People are saying they want accountability, but they don't want accountability, they want blood. And that's very different. And if we're trying to be in a society where we're in deep connection with one another, where we are able to heal when harm is caused, when we're able to be accountable when we cause harm, when we're able to apologize, when we're able to build in a way that's actually about future building, then that's re really different. And so, yeah, you know, cancel culture has been sort of this like clickbait phrase at this point, but I actually want to um, call for a new framework, which is carceral culture. We have all digested that culture and it's our turn to unlearn it. And, and my solve for this, um, and many of us as abolitionists, is build an abolitionist culture, a culture that is actually centered around care. Hmm. There, there's another issue which you also have personally experienced, and that is inter-community uh, conflict. It distracts us from the real problems at hand. It makes it harder to keep our eyes on the prize, as, as, as has been said. How can these types of conflicts be tr turned into transformative action? Love that. Well, intercommunity conflict is going to happen. Um, human beings are messy. Uh, we hurt each other. We get hurt. Um, we are often um, dealing with trauma. We are dealing with the impact of that trauma. And so there's no judgment there. Intercommunity conflict is inevitable. That's why having systems and a new culture to deal with that conflict is so necessary. 
much of what this book is, is just years and years of my own learning, years and years of my own mistakes that I've made on the road toward this abolitionist journey. And it's me trying to give an offering. Um, I believe that our movement is on the vanguard of uh, making change happen in the world. And if we can't get this right around abolition, we can't expect the rest of the world to get it right. And so when we have intercommunity conflict, you know, um, it's hard. There have been many times that I tried to use these steps to deal with an intercommunity conflict and it didn't work. And that's not, that's not um, something that I'm judgmental of, but it just means we have to practice, practice, practice. Uh, abolition is not just something you wake up and you do overnight. That's something that you have to learn, you have to lean into, and you have to practice. Hmm. Last time you were on the show, uh, things were a little bit different. You were under uh, critique, you were under uh, severe uh, scrutiny from the world. Uh, I'm looking at you now, you look a lot happier, a lot lighter. Where are you now, mentally, emotionally, politically? How do you feel? What's, what's going on? Thank you for that. Um, it was a hard year last year. It was a year that um, I wasn't sure I would make it um, truly as, as a human being that I would stay, that I would be able to stay alive amongst um, all of the um, scrutiny and some of it was attacks and some of it was valid criticisms. Um, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot and I continue to learn a lot. Um, I feel really not grateful that I experienced that. That was really painful, but I feel really grateful for the practices that I've had and the people I have in community I have in my life that get to reflect um, the true me um, and that get to hold me accountable in a way that's loving and firm. And I wish for the rest of us, especially for Black people, that we're able to be held in loving ways and kind ways as we deal with a world that's often treating us really horribly. You know, I uh, just maybe 10 years ago, which feels like forever ago now in pandemic years, I was at uh, Gustavus uh, Davis College in Minnesota with Angela Davis, and we were giving a talk on abolition. And at that time, it seemed absurd to people that there would be a conversation about abolition, you know? Yes. And Angela told me at that time that when she first started lecturing on prisons a few decades earlier than that, it was hard to even get a speech, that it was hard to get attention for this because it was such a taboo issue to talk about prisons in like decent, dignified, middle-class space. And to now go from being able to yes. talk about prisons 30 years ago to being able to talk about abolition in a serious but marginal way 10 years ago to now having your work at the center of the conversation. And it's as a mainstream vision for justice and freedom for our people, it shows that our struggles work, that our efforts at, 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 at pushing the, 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 the ball down the field and, and moving toward freedom and justice, it works when we stay committed. And you are a marker of that commitment, Patrice. I'm, I'm so happy for you. I'm so proud of you and this book. And I'm so grateful that everybody now gets to see what I know, which is that you are somebody with a wealth of experience, compassion, and just a tireless love, not just for freedom and justice, but for our people. Everybody, the book is called An Abolitionist Handbook, 12 Steps to Changing Yourself and the World. It is available wherever books are sold. But of course, I always think you should get it at an independent Black-owned bookstore. Anyway, avid fans of our show already know the drill, but for our new viewers, let me remind you that there's really only one independent black bookstore you should go to, but I ain't gonna tell you what the name is, but you go look it up, you're gonna find it.